This video is brought to you by Ren. Wonder Twin powers activate. Shape of an eagle. Form of water. Retrospective Activate The Wonder Twins, characters who have left a profound impact on certain corners of the DC Universe, and yet can be completely unknown to others. The Wonder Twins have been both loved and hated, and found themselves revived again and again, seemingly after having been forgotten. Just who were they, or are they, and what is it about them that keeps endearing them to some and not to others? How was it that these two were able to leave such a footprint on the comic book industry? Not only are we going to track their footprints, but you can also track your own, courtesy of Ren. I'm pleased to be partnering with Wren, who are a public benefit company dedicated to doing something to improve the climate crisis. This in many ways, but in the way I'm most excited about is in the form of planting trees. And trees are what everyone needs, not just the Lorax. Everyone emits some level of CO2 in their lifestyle and leaves a carbon footprint. Wren allows you to calculate said carbon footprint by answering a few questions about your lifestyle, and then offers you ways to counteract it. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. And it's not just planting trees, it's also mineral weathering or rainforest protection. I'm big on the reforestation projects and community tree planting. Preserving biodiversity is as interesting as it is important. Should you choose to get involved and contribute, you'll get monthly updates on the projects you've backed, as well as pictures, so if you plant a tree, you'll get to see the tree. If you're interested in reducing your carbon footprint, I will have a link for you to check them out down below. Offset your carbon footprint on Wren. The first 100 people to sign up using the link in the description will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. You can be lord of the trees. Positive, non-supervillain environmentalism. Fun for the whole family. And now, on to the Wonder Twins. Get Get ready for 70s memes, 90s edge, and some modern time of recording sex jokes. The Wonder Twins have it all. I'm Sasha, this is Casually Comics, and it's time to enter the realm of teen sidekicks. Form of an origin. The Wonder Twins debuted in the all-new Super Friends Hour, produced by Hanna-Barbera Productions in 1977, which was an update on the Super Friends, who'd had a first season which ran in 1973 to 1974. Where it gets a bit confusing is that there have been several iterations of the Super Friends, but when it's discussed, sometimes they're all lumped into one, so it makes it sound as if it were one long-running, ongoing show, but that was not really the case. There were stops, starts, sometimes the series would be retooled or reformatted, a different amount of segments, different characters, things like that. In the three-year gap between the original Super Friends and All New, some changes were made. The Wonder Twins were created to replace the original sidekick characters, Wendy, Marvin, and the Wonder Dog. These characters were like an abbreviated Scooby Gang, and they would often end up solving the case at the end of episodes. But wouldn't it be better if we all cooperated in solving Glacier's problems? No. You're a very clever scientist. We have good scientists. Why couldn't we all get together to solve your problem? There has been less of a push to see more of them, and yet they also made the transfer over into DC Comics, and some really brutal things happened to them. It was felt that these characters just weren't matching the tone or bringing in the youth. So enter Zan and Gina, their pet monkey, Gleek. Their creation is attributed to Norman Marrer, whose name I cannot say, William Hanna, and Joseph Barbera. These characters had some time spent on them. They were also initially meant to be much more powerful. A lot of their history has been detailed by Hanna-Barbera animator Daryl McNeil, and you know I have quotes. McNeil stated, Originally, Zan, Dick, had plastic man powers, and Jaina, Jane, could transform into anything, not just animals, but they were scaled back to their present powers as it made the other super friends, even Superman, seem almost superfluous. He had a lot more to say, and some of it's really interesting, so get ready. More quotes. Their costumes' purple hues came from giving them a color scheme and colors that none of the other super friends had. At one time, they shared the same skin tone as the other friends, but had purple hair. That was changed to black hair and a darker skin tone to ethnicize them a bit. Also, at one time in the development process, they were going to have sunlight or lack of the same affect their powers as well, both of which were dropped during development in favor of the now famous Wonder Twins Power Activate Touch. You may have noted that they had other names, Dick and Jane, and also the monkey was going to be called Mighty Monkey. However, their names were shifted as a nod to Tarzan and Jane from Edgar Rice Burroughs' work. I'm not sure why you would want twins named after romantic interests, but it's fine. Just moving on. The ears are not to Spock, and the hair, while also seemingly a Vulcan nod, is at least in Jane's case rumored to be attributed to an animation checker working at Hanna-Barbera at the time as an ode to her. Their 
Their personalities were modeled off of the, at the time, inescapable Osmonds, specifically Donnie and Marie. The all new Super Friends, the season in which they debuted, had four segments. This over the period of an hour long episode, which was then broken up, and it tended to be 46 to 48 minutes depending upon the ad breaks. The Wonder Twins debuted in the first episode in September of 1977 in the second segment entitled Joyride. The Wonder Twins and Space Monkey Gleek have to teach some youngsters a lesson about the dangers of joyriding in an airplane. Oh boy, I can't wait to be lectured by the Wonder Twins. The Wonder Twins would come out the gate taking up a lot of space on the show. Not only for their first season would they take up the second segment, but they would also feature in the third, which was a group or team segment, and sometimes the fourth. Also, sometimes they would give health and safety tips or first aid tips in between. So they went from nowhere to everywhere. Their goal was to be more relatable, so while they had powers and could be helpful, they also made mistakes. The goal was that ideally kids could relate to them more than the perfect heroes, and also they would provide some comedic relief. They were supposed to be funny. Mileage varied. Jaina, is that you? Who do you think it is? The bionic butterfly? Their on-screen debut was very quickly followed by a Super Friends comic tie-in. This in October of 1977. Form of a comic book origin. The Wonder Twins debut in Super Friends number 7, written by E. Nelson Bridwell, with art by Ramona Fratton. Inks by Bob Smith. They would eventually get a whole origin here. It would take some time to be fully partitioned out, but you get some of it here in issue 7. Look at this cover here. They're shoving Wendy and Marvin out of the way, which seems to be a decent indicator of how those original sidekicks were viewed at the time. They never even explain where they go once they leave. Your time is past, kids. This is a job for the new Super Friends. The story opens with the Wonder Twins crashing on Earth, which the original sidekicks see and bike over to investigate. Right away, the Wonder Twins demonstrate their powers by fist bumping and saying, powers activate. Gina can shapeshift and Zan can turn into water. Side note, it always bothered me that sometimes Marvin looked like he was drawn in an entirely different art style than Wendy. Just why? The Wonder Twins are speaking in alien dialect, but thanks to the original sidekicks knowing Interlac, which is kind of like an intergalactic language, kind of like Federation Standard, I am a nerd. They're able to communicate. The Wonder Twins come with a warning. They were on a planet and overheard one of Superman's enemies, Grax, plotting his demise by, well, destroying the Earth. They didn't know anything about the Earth or Superman, but being good people, they wanted to help. So they warned the League so they can deal with the bombs Grax has placed around the planet. These issues are fascinating. In fact, the entire Super Friends is interesting because Bridwell was a canon fiend, and so he attempted to work these into the overall DC canon on Earth-1. They end up being categorized as their own Earth, but A for effort. In issue 9, it's revealed the twins are orphans and they ask if they can stay with the League and learn from them like Marvin and Wendy did. And they sure went somewhere. They do explain where they go. They're going off to post-secondary education, but they don't explain that on the show so they just vanish. In issue 10, Batman finds them a place with his professor friend, Professor Nichols, a scientist who vows to help them acclimate to Earth. They get the emblems on their costumes which are modeled off of the Superman logo. It's got their initials on it. You seem to like the look of my S symbol, so I thought you should have them since you're training to be superheroes. Ah, oh, the good old days where we didn't have to pretend that Superman was too cool to just like having his own stuff monogrammed. Professor Nichols sets them up as foreign exchange students, Johan and Johanna, from Fleming, Sweden. They get Zan a wig and then Jana just shapeshifts. And then they end up going to Gotham High those poor children. In issue 12, Zan has to turn her reign to refresh Aquaman. That's not important. It's just amusing. Actually, scratch that. It is important. Put a pin in it. Issue 14 is where you get most of the details on their backstory, and they're revealed to have a pretty sad one. They are mutants from the planet Exor, which you're going to see spelled with both one X or two X's. You'll see it both ways, and there's also going to be different names over time for what they call the people who live on the planet. So you're going to hear me say it a bunch of ways. That's their fault, not mine. They started it. The twins have a throwback gene to a time when their people could shapeshift, but it's weak and they need each other to activate their powers. Their parents die during a plague, and since they are viewed as freaks, no one wants them. So they are adopted by the owner of a space circus named Dentwin. This is so that they can be part of his freak show. He forces them to shapeshift for customers, and he also doesn't give them any money for it. But in a rarity for comics, there's a nice clown who works at the circus and really takes them under his wing, and he gives them glee and also raises them. Over time, the Wonder Twins become more and more dissatisfied with their conditions and what they're being forced to do, especially because they're not even being compensated for it. So they eventually escape, which is how they end up on the planet, where they overhear Grax's plan. And so it goes. In the comics, they have a slower burn than they do in the show. You see them getting trained and finding their footing, but they still met with a mixed response. Here are some letters from issue 10. You know I love to read the letters column. Dear Editor, Super Friends number 7 was by far the worst issue yet. 1 to 5 were fantastic. 6 wasn't so hot, but 7 was awful. Why? Let me decide where to start. To begin with, the 
unknown heroes were very, very bad. By the way, the Ramona Fradden and Bob Smith on Super Friends aren't the same ones who illustrate Plastic Man, are they? Nah, can't be. The ones on PM are good artists. Also, the original Super Friends, not counting Wendy and Marvin, were only seen in 16 of the 85 panels, and 12 of those were Superman. The Wonder Twins were almost as bad as Wendy and Marvin. Don't get me wrong, I like Super Friends, but not number seven, and will continue to do so as long as the stories are as good as one to six. Six wasn't that bad after all. Chuck Miller. <laughs> I just, I really want Chuck to be a real person. That letter's great. Form of audience response. The Wonder Twins were certainly innovable if you were watching the all new Super Friends and some of the seasons later on. Over time, over those various iterations, they would come to be used less and less. Eventually they'd be phased out not only for Firestorm, who would at first start replacing them, but by the last season, they would be replaced entirely. This was for the Super Powers Team Galactic Guardians, which ran in 1985 to 1986. There they were completely replaced by Cyborg. You must be Firestorm. Huh? How did you know? Enhanced hearing. I recognize your voice. Far out. It's a bit hard to gauge because it's been so long since the Wonder Twins were around what the general consensus was at the time. But there's a lot more vocal and written evidence for them not being the best liked. The Wonder Twins seem like characters who could land with some of their intended demographic or below, but also be reviled by not only some who they were aimed at, but by older fans as well, who would be the fans who you would be more likely to hear from. So potentially there were some younger fans who really liked it, but weren't in a position to actually say anything about it, or maybe were even embarrassed to if they saw that they were so disliked. Here are some musings looking back on the Wonder Twins in a less than positive light. Gina and Zan took over as the morons of the show after Marvin and Wendy and their goddamn dog in a cape left. Their powers weren't very good. He turned into water, she turned into animals, and their monkey had a bucket. But fighting wasn't what they were there for. They were comic relief. Comic relief in cartoons didn't make you laugh. They were just a couple of people that we hated more than anyone else. After you watch the Wonder Twins wander into lava, make shitty puns, and lose a fight to a parked bicycle, you'll actually start cheering for Aquaman. And here's a positive one, just for balance. My love of the Wonder Twins is a bit askew, but as a first gen kid of an Asian immigrant, my mom, the Wonder Wonder Twins spoke to me because they looked like me. They had brown skin and black hair, but spoke like ordinary American teens. I didn't relate to Samurai, who was clearly a Japanese person, so that whole idea of inclusion totally worked on me in a way that the creators probably didn't expect. It's probably a good thing they didn't give the Wonder Twins purple skin as they were originally designed, otherwise I might not have gravitated towards them. Yeah, ethnicizing them as McNeil stated worked. In general, the Super Friends era has entered a realm of near obscurity. For example, did you know that there was a whole season when Darkseid was trying to marry Wonder Woman? I do now and it's great. Be that as it may, there are a certain segment of DC fans who remember it quite well. And yet for others, it's like it never happened. And the series, while it's been collected, is not exactly Exactly being clamored for. It is clear that the twins did have fans over in some corners of media because they keep popping up. And these will be after decades of absence. They would return and enter the DC comic realm in the 90s. Just in time for an extreme revamp. Oh, the edge. Form of extreme. The Wonder Twins would appear this time in the main DC universe in the comic Extreme Justice. This was a Justice League spin-off comic. It replaced Justice League International, which had become Justice League Europe. It ran for 19 issues, which includes the issue zero. The Wonder Twins would be introduced in issue nine, this under Ivan Velez Jr. Velez was a self-confessed Wonder Twins fan, but he wanted to bring them back in a darker way. He was quite candid about his plans in the interview with Back Issue. He stated, I liked the Wonder Twins. Let's face it, comic books are all corny to some degree. I was trying to play with the nostalgic element of the whole Super Friends canon. I love how some people have taken the old and twisted things just right to come up with something new. I was gonna introduce the Wonder Twins into the DC universe and have them be these little desperate, sad little characters. Slaves forced into hard labor and desperately trying to remain free and alive. However, Velez and the book's editor, Ruben Diaz, had very different ideas about how the book should go. And so issue nine, when the twins returned, was also Velez's last issue, which is something he also talked about. He stated, Extreme justice was never as grim and gritty as I wanted it to be. 
I wanted the twins to be extremely likable and a little sad and have them become members of a strange and dysfunctional family. And yes, I was gonna trap them all on a planet of purple monkeys for a spell. I'm a little sad we didn't get to see the purple monkey planet. Issue nine does indeed set up a very grim existence for the twins, but some of it also harkens back to their first super friends appearance in issue number seven, origin wise. For example, when they show up, they can't speak the language and that ends up being a plot point. Although apparently it is interlac and you can translate it. They end up scaring the local populace even though they're only looking for food. But I mean, look at the animal Jana transforms into. It's got that 90 spiky fur art. The Justice League end up engaging them and they end up breaking Zan's device that is keeping him from transporting back to their master. And so Jana breaks hers and able to be without her brother. It's all ever so slimy and uncomfortable. Insolent slugs, virulent pustules. You really think you can ever escape me? How dare you? You know how precious she is to me. How badly I covet her. No, thank you. This overseer is looking for a device called the Jurixan Flesh Driver. I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's just a really nice massage wand. This plot would not be picked up again until issue 14 under new writer Robert L. Washington III. Now you can really read that. The font in issue 14 sometimes hurts and onwards. There's some bizarre font choices in this series. And I should know because I've picked some bad fonts. Kerning, what is that? The twins appear at the end of issue 14, and oh, why are they posing Gina like that? I would like less slave girl ass, please. Issue 15 just rushes through the twins' new backstory, info dumping in a race to get them out of servitude and back to some semblance of comic relief Wonder Twins of old. Their new backstory, however, is dark, horrifying, and has some interesting implications that they don't ever fully explore, and also points borrows heavily from Starfire's backstory. Initially in this issue, the twins appear in chains, and nobody can understand them, and they're talking talking to this overseer who brought them, and then that person just vanishes. And then Firestorm's drunk, because they were out before, and so he decides to give them a beer, because that is the intergalactic language. And they drink the beer, and they think it's gross, but Booster, in his sweet new exosuit with Skeets Incorporated within, is able to get some translation going in nearly illegible font. Oh, and Jane is saying that they don't mate with people as part of their introductory rituals. Great, fantastic, off to a wonderful start. The flesh driver that was mentioned in issue nine has become part of Booster Gold's suit, part of the Tech Incorporated into it. Booster's new suit was a whole plot point on its own. Okay, new backstory time. Now the twins were rulers of Exor, but also seemingly part of a council. Their powers are now no longer a mutation, but a God-given right given to them by the universe. Yes, our powers are granted us directly by the 10 elements of the universe themselves to protect and rule our people. But then they experienced first contact and did not go well. The aliens offered vast technological superiority in exchange for servants and slaves. Zan and Jaina were against it, but they were overruled by their council. And then it got worse. It was revealed that Soylent Green must have been these aliens' favorite movie because what fueled the new technology was the life force of Xan and Jaina's people. This origin gets into some uncomfortable topics that could be interesting to mine and discuss. Some themes, but no, it doesn't do that. Don't worry about it. Xan and Jaina select people to be shipped out and install overseers with special authority from those groups who come to relish their new positions and away become their own ruling class. Xan and Jaina try to start something once they learn the truth about the tech but people are against them, so they themselves end up being stripped of their regency and placed into bondage. But they still want to help, so they escape with the flesh driver, which is this important piece of tech that does something. Well, now it powers Booster's suit, and that's all it needs to do, I guess. Skeet says that it's not feeding off of Booster because he's been feeding it bursts of quantum energy. So are Zan and Jaina quantum powered? Then it gets confusing. Some of the people from Exor show up, and then Zan and Jaina pick the League as their champions to fight for them slash with them. We claim the right to have these, our chosen keepers of the flesh driver, join our circle. Forget this, it's not too late. As fire from above, I was meant to be your mate, as was my twin. This is Zelox, and this doesn't matter. Also, what's happening? So they have to fight their way out of the circle to win something, their freedom. So they win, and they have the flesh driver, so they control the planet again. The Wonder Twins decide not to go back to their people because the people don't agree with their whole let's not enslave our people for tech philosophy. They say the overseer are the true rulers now. You were right, the people fear individuality and community more than the caste system we despise. Those were a lot of words that don't really say anything all that deep, even though it sounds like they should. So the Wonder Twins just decide to stay and assimilate. Mm. That sounds like it's time for a funny sequence at the mall with them eating food court food. The panels of them eating food in issue 17 are horrific. 
And is Zan supposed to be blending with that headband? They briefly talk about their people's struggles, but forget it, there's mall food to eat and mall butt to stare at in other panels. There's a clear push here to put the Wonder Twins back in some semblance of a comedic support role like they occupied decades earlier. But with their deeply troubling history, it just comes across as jarring. They also feel very different in this 90s art style. They don't really gel with this version of the team, but they're not there long. Afterwards, in their pre-rebirth time, because they skipped the New 52 entirely, they spend most of it in small cameos or background appearances. Their most significant moment after this occurs in Young Justice. Here they're seen trying to eat some CDs because they don't understand Earth customs, but no one can understand them. This occurs in 2002. Once more, the Wonder Twins seem destined for obscurity. They vanished from the DC Comics verse long before the New 52 reboot in 2011, which was a company-wide reboot. However, before their comic return, they would pop up some other places. Form of Somebody Save Me. In 2009, the Wonder Twins would enter the Smallville universe in the episode Idol, the eighth episode of the ninth season. Here they have the same powers, but no Gleek, but it's okay, he's a picture on their phone, and their phones make the Gleek noise. In this episode, the Wonder Twins are attempting to be heroes, and they're inspired by the Blur, which is what Clark was called at the time. So they're trying to solve crimes, and they leave the crest of L places. Clark knocks them out and takes them to the Watchtower. Chloe tells them that they may be trying to help, but they actually aren't. However, despite this, of course, the twins end up being a big help. And Clark ends up telling them that one day they'll be heroes in their own right. And of course, during the episode, they get called the Wonder Twins. We're not the hero. You are. That depends on you. The later seasons of Smallville would bring in whatever concepts they could, sometimes to pad out what was going on. The introduction of the Wonder Twins was met with some bashing on certain forums. I will now read you a forum thread because it's glorious. Why in the world would they do this to themselves? It's like they're begging people to hate the show. I've been wanting them to bring a Shazam the Wizard or Captain Marvel reference into the mix for a while now, but instead of bringing in a character with some chops, they bring in the twins. Aggravated is not the word for it. Krypton Hero 25 replied, Even though there are somewhat corny characters, it kind of makes sense to bring them in. This season is supposed to be Clark's darkest hour, so having these quirky characters appear will probably add some humor and lighten things up. Disafrigerer 1190 replied, Clark has had eight years of darkest hours. How is this year different? Neil before Zod came in with this amazing zinger. It's extra special dark this year. <laughs> Despite some bemoaning their inclusion and the fact that by the end of the episode everything's returned to the status quo, this isn't a bad outing for the Wonder Twins. It's a decent representation of them. It takes their earnest desire to be heroes and the fact that they make mistakes and incorporates it into Clark's expanding mythos. It doesn't overly mock them, but it also doesn't edify them or try to make them dark and gritty. For those who are fans of them, it is a nice update for them. They would later reappear in the Smallville continuation comic and have their backstory expanded upon. While not aliens, some elements were kept, such as being rejected by society and trying to be Swedish exchange students. It didn't work that time. Their names would be referenced in the Flash episode, but nothing really comes of it. When it comes to adaptational appearances, Smallville is a bit of an outlier. It was much more common to see the twins return in a mocking fashion, sometimes with some slightly mean undercurrents. Although it could also be in good fun. The Harvey Birdman episode even featured Michael Bell reprising his role as Zan. But for a time, it seemed to be that to bring these characters forward, you needed to almost overly highlight the fact that they were silly. Almost as a form of, yes, I know, but kind of a tongue-in-cheek, sheepish kind of acknowledgement. Not just being able to come out and unabashedly adore the Wonder Twins. In 2006, Adult Swim ran a series of dark webisodes about them called The New Adventures of the Wonder Twins, where the Wonder Twins' mistakes ended up killing people. Ah, the Wonder Twins. Glad you could make it. Sorry, we got held up by an... eagle. Where are the teens? Yeah, I suspect they're at the morgue by now. It was a combination of classic animation from the Super Friends episodes and newly drawn inserts. Teen Titans Go! took a more lighthearted but equally mocking approach. This in 2013's You're Fired from Season 1 Episode 14 of the series. The Titans are looking for a new member to replace Beast Boy, and they love Jaina's powers but not Zan's. But since they're a package deal, they have to get both, so they just install Zan in their house as admin. Zan, my man! Beast Boy, what are you doing here? I'm here to help. We're gonna get your sister fired. <gasps> I do hate this job, but I could never do that. Well, if that's how you want things to be, 
my soda could use some ice. Seeing as how this is Teen Titans Go, the entire tone is silly, and it's not just the Wonder Twins up for being mocked. The thing is, again, all of these adaptations have that one common thread. They're nostalgic, it's a remembrance, and less an attempt to actively use the characters or have them become part of an overall series or universe as they were back in their Super Friends days. They were around because people remembered them, either somewhat fondly or something that they could make jokes about. But in 2019, an actual push would be made for the Wonder Twins an attempt to make them part of DC canon proper again. Form of Wonder Comics. Wonder Comics was found in 2018, the passion project of Brian Michael Bendis, who curated the universe. The goal of this imprint was to revive old characters and create new ones. This to revitalize the main DC universe and also hopefully appeal to some younger fans. Bendis stated, We want to celebrate that absolutely wondrous time of life when you are just about to become the person you are destined to be. When you just start to discover your true potential and even that magical moment when you first start to figure out the world before the world figures out you. Okay. We want to make comics that celebrate wonder, the wonder of life, love, and comics. That is one of the most idealized talks of teenage them I've heard in a while. Press X to doubt because I already lived through it. This is the imprint that sees the birth of Naomi and brings back Young Justice and dilates for Hero and the Wonder Twins. The Wonder Twins were initially brought back for a six issue mini, this being helmed by Mark Russell. The series would end up doing so well that it would be extended another six issues, making it ultimately a 12 issue series. Everybody working on the project were big fans of the Wonder Twins and they were seeking to create a fun comic for them. Despite the fact that some of Russell's comments made it sound like it could tip towards Ed he stated, Well, the Wonder Twins themselves, I kind of view as one really good, well-adjusted person tragically split in half. So they're basically incomplete people. Which is, I think, the way every teen feels. They're dealing with deep deficits in their personality, and they feel awkward and alienated because of it, not realizing that everyone else feels exactly the same way. That's the sort of dynamic I wanted to give to the Wonder Twins. They are deeply alienated teenagers who are just beginning to work out who they really are. I wanted them with superpowers to go through the same process I think every teenager goes through, whether or not they have superpowers. The artist of the series, Stephen Byrne, had a much more lighthearted take. He stated, The thing I really liked about the Wonder Twins as a kid, and it still resonates with me, is that they're young and imperfect enough that they're allowed to get into trouble and make bad decisions. Whereas Superman and Batman are kind of godlike in how righteous they were, the Wonder Twins were given more freedom to not only make errors in moral judgment, but also be the ones who don't have to come up with a solution for every crisis. The Wonder Twins series is a full-on comedic one. It stars the Wonder Twins in high school and has them having to acclimate to Earth and balance their internship at the Hall of Justice, all while accidentally getting swept up in some low-key superhero shenanigans. While the story does have one pretty cringeworthy joke, joke from issue one that tends to be highlighted. Although, of course, Milo is very humorous subjective. It's the thunderlust joke, though. Whenever there's a thunderstorm, Exorian adults will drop whatever they're doing and start tearing off their clothes. Driven mad with thunderlust, Exorians ride together, bonded in a single rhythm with the night. Men become women, women become animals, and the night throbs with their pleasure. And then Zan was given attention and a talking to, and his guardians were called. I see the pawn far joke. I acknowledge it, as well as the cultural miscommunication alien joke. Oh, you know Zan got thunderless later on. Zan is characterized as a bit of an oblivious, enthusiastic fanboy, a play on the lovable idiot, while Gina is your smarter but more anti-social and at points almost emo, more competent sort. Thunderless aside, the book has some solid jokes and some tongue-in-cheek references, but also maintains the feel of the original Wonder Twins in terms of dynamic for the most part. There's more of an emphasis on how they can be underfoot and how they can be viewed as annoying, but it's also balanced with a clear love of the characters and a desire to have fun. This series wants you to have fun with the concept of the Wonder Twins, painting them with the enjoyment the creators of this series got from them. There is no malice here, no shame in liking them, and no attempts to make them dark, which in its own way may be viewed as refreshing, unless one felt that darkness is what they were missing. Their backstory is updated, now they're on Earth because their father is a friend of Superman, and Superman's doing him a favor by bringing them to Earth. There are some decent supporting characters introduced, but it does still have a very Super Friends-y vibe, and when the Wonder Twins appear places like Action Comics or Justice League, their role is more minimal. The comedy doesn't overtake their other appearance, but it is still present. They're hovering in between serious characters and farce. They are interns at the Hall of Justice, so they can serve a function. They can help evacuate people, they can take calls. There's a reason for them to appear in panels. Justice League 65 has a callback to how Zan's powers have been used to help Aquaman. This by having Zan turn into a bucket of
of water to be thrown on him. Outside of the Wonder Twins, these two would be most utilized in the comic Young Justice. This starting in issue 12 when Bendis started a giant adventure to bring all the characters in the Wonder Line together. The Wonder Twins work well here in the sense that they feel like they belong as part of this team. They're not treated as out of place or as if they have much more to learn as they are with the older League members, which works well and lends itself to the idea that they could be part of this younger team. However, they also very quickly get lost inside of this arc. There are a lot of characters at play here, and in some points they begin to blend and sound the same. The Wonder Twins fade a bit when they aren't placed against the Justice League, which makes them feel a bit more unique, because the Justice League tend to have a bit more distinct voices than some of the characters here. When it comes to this team up, Xan isn't the only overzealous Spanish one, and Gina isn't the only snarky girl. Also, the Wonder Twins are utilized in the Wonder Line and the works that Bendis was working on. Outside of that, they didn't appear over much. There weren't a huge list of creators clamoring to use the Wonder Twins. Their appeal was still niche. They do pop up randomly, however, such as in DC vs. Vampires, where Zan got blended into a Wonder Twin shake by Hal Jordan, who then drank him. While they had a place, and now a purpose, and could be brought in, they were still at the whims of those who had a fondness for them. Which is where they stand time of recording. So after going through their history and looking at the various reactions, what is it that keeps the twins coming back? These two characters have the ability to resonate strongly with certain people. While they were quite consciously manufactured to be relatable in terms of appearance and personality, there were some things that clicked and some additional elements that some fans latched onto. The fact that they weren't perfect. The fact that they had such a strong bond with each other. The fact that they were excitable and could be excited. For some, a connection happened. As mentioned, some feel they are more popular with the younger viewer, but that those viewers didn't have a voice, while others feel that it's simply a case of those who got them really got them, or read more into them, which is something you see, for example, in the likes of Russell's quote. There are reasons to read more into them. They do have a low-key tragic backstory, even in the original one. The idea of being the sidekick and not the main hero is a compelling fantasy for some. To have that room to grow, to make mistakes, and in some cases maybe have more fun. Or some may relate to the fact that they weren't as popular within the fandom itself. A mesh of fandom and the show itself. The idea that they themselves may have felt like they didn't fully fit in either. And so identify with these characters who weren't being as well received. Characters can resonate in fascinating ways that aren't always self-evident or intended. On the other hand, if one was relating to the more main heroes, creations like the Wonder Twins can feel like an obnoxious intrusion, taking time away from the heroes one really wants to see. Their mistakes won't be relatable, but irritating. Their attempts at humor grating. The Wonder Twins are the type of character who tend to elicit a reaction if one knows of them. Watching their older adventures now, time of recording, has a much different feel, and one may be drawn to the relative simplicity of their plots and cheerful tone, or find them woefully outdated. Fans of the Wonder Twins have enough of a passion for them to keep them coming back, and time of recording, that seems like it's going to continue. Because they're getting a movie on HBO Max, time of recording, hold me to nothing, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, did it come out in this diffusion, did you see it, did you like it, tell me things. But yeah, as of 2022, that's supposed to be happening. I mean, if HBO Max can make a Peacemaker series, then why not? There are some who really want to make the twins come back in a more lasting way. You see it from Vela's trying to make them dark sables, from Bendis trying to incorporate them so hard into the Wonderline. But are they the types of characters who can stick? Or are they the types of characters who end up pulling focus if they're too utilized? Is a small independent series the right way to go with them? I need to hear everything. I need to know if you originally really liked the Wonder Twins or if you hated them. Had you heard of them before this video? How do you feel they work the best? Lighthearted or edge something else? Tell me things down below. It was really fun to go back and revisit some of their early appearances. Also, if you have a favorite episode, tell me that too. Thanks so much for taking this time today to spend it discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it. And please do all those YouTube things, the liking, the commenting, the sharing, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.